Okay, our next talk is by Ash, Ash Sayal, and the talk is Packaging Science and Technology to Deliver Sustainable IPM Programs for an Invasive Pest, Spotted Wing Drosophila. Ash, you're all you. All right, thank you all very much for being here this, this morning. When I was writing my uh, title for this talk, I did not know who I was going to be speaking after. <laughs> Had I known that before, I would have deleted very technology out of my talk. But, but I, I did not do that. What I did, I modified the context to focus more on science and left technology toward the tail end of my talk. By that time, you have forgotten what Joe said. <laughs> all right. As you all know, and you have heard, in several talks at the meeting and some posters also that SWD has become a major issue in the United States. It's originally from China, Korea and that part of the world. It was first discovered in the U.S. mainland in 2008 in California. Since then it has spread all across the country. Again, don't you know, misinterpret the red color in different states. It's 2016 and red and blue and this all things that have, have been going around, but it just indicates that these states already have SWD confirmed in there, which includes uh, almost all of them except uh, three states. This is how SWD looks. Males have two dark spots on the, uh, their wings, and that's where the spotted wing name comes from. There's another way to identify males. Is on their forelegs, they have these uh, two dark uh, combs, their dark hair structures. If they don't have or the wing uh, spots are fade, you can always use this uh, feature to identify the males. Females also have a very distinct feature. You have to, in some cases, so you can identify even without a microscope, but it's very clear under the hand lens or microscope. They have a this clarified uh, ovipositor, which has serrations on it, which females uses to puncture a healthy fruit, oviposit acts in the fruit, and that's where uh, the games begin. We did a study just to see how damage in a blueberry would progress after a female uh, oviposits in uh, a healthy blueberry. Once a female oviposits eggs, actually those eggs have two breathing tubes that stick stand out of the fruit, be it uh, blueberry, obviously being a uh, dark colored blueberry, uh, that these uh, breathing tubes are more visible. Even uh, in raspberries or other fruits, you, you can see those clearly. Once females have laid, laid eggs, larvae had to come out within 24 hours. And that's when they start feeding. And this is how damage progresses from that point on. And this study was done you know, under lab conditions, obviously, at 24 degrees. If you look at real situation that we experience in the south, in the field, this process would happen much faster. Basically, within three to five days, the fruit becomes unmarketable. Even if it's not marketable, while in the fruit, it just, uh, it's going to make it at some point during the uh, marketing chain in the process. This whole process from mobilization to a real emergency, it, it can happen within eight to 10 days, which means that this SWD can go through several generations during the field season. But bring up the numbers and cause real serious issues in the uh, small foods, wherever they are. Economic losses are huge. The reason is that there's zero tolerance in the market. Every single pilot gets inspected, sampled. And in the sample, if there's one blueberry, raspberry, whatever, with the maggot in it, whole pellet is out. And we have seen pictures from big uh, producers, the whole loads, the whole shipments basically get rejected. So the economic losses are huge, as you can see here. In, in Georgia blueberries, we saw uh, first time in uh, 2012, 15% crop loss. In 2013, we had lots of rainfall, which led to actually after 20% crop loss, lots of people, once they saw significant infestation, they just walked away, they did not even harvest. Because you cannot make even the cost of harvest 
when you start selling for Jews. So it's economic losses are huge. When I started here in my position, we first started with monitoring SWD basically to find where within the state do we have these SWD populations with respect to major small fruits that we have in the state. Obviously, blueberry is the biggest one. And then during the uh, 2014, which was my first field season, we confirmed 29 counties with SWD. We continued that to 2015, and we added three more counties. In this map, you are seeing counties which are where either expert entomologists or our county agents have confirmed those. We only check counties when we have confirmed by, with an expert eye that SWD was uh, there. But there are, there are some other maggots that I have seen lots of samples from uh, county agents that are actually, maggots obviously look like they are SWD, but they actually are not. So there are other uh, fruit flies or uh, vinegar flies. So these are uh, counties were confirmed by an expert and then they were marked on, on this map. So this map includes almost most of the counties where we have blueberries in the state. This is our major blueberry about southeastern end of the state. About seven to eight counties have more than 95% of the blueberry production in the state. And all of those counties have SWD. And I will show you how the population works in the later in the talk. In uh, last year, we started a study in six counties within those major blueberry producing counties to monitor how population of SWD works. Just a little bit more about phenology. Since this is a new pest, everybody is kind of beginning to learn biology of this pest and phenology within different regions. But we started this study to see how populations of SWD will vary or occur during different parts of the year. And at, in, uh, at the blueberry farms, how do they move from blueberry farms to neighboring wooded areas to different kinds of landscapes that we have around. These were six main counties uh, where blueberries are uh, produced. We had nine traps set up at each location, as you can see, three in the wooded areas, right next to our blueberries, here is the map, and three right at the border, first row of blueberries right from the wooded area, and uh, three traps right in the middle of the blueberry field just to see how SWD uh, move around between different locations. As you can see here, these uh, studies, this, this is a survey of SWD population at those uh, selected farms was run for now, it's over a year now. But I'll show you uh, full year data from last March through this February. As you can see, if when you look at the total number of SWD caught per track, we had more flies caught per trap during the winter months, late fall, winter. Now this is kind of a, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. The reason I think is that during summer, our temperatures are so high that flies don't do very well under those conditions. Even if they survive, they kind of stay quieter in the wooded areas and just pass the high temperature part of the year or part of the day. When it comes to winter, or when temperatures are milder for them, then they thrive. Now, if we analyze those data based on three locations I described, wooded areas have the maximum number of flies. Most of the flies, and almost any part of the year, wooded areas have higher number of flies per trap than the blueberries themselves, even during the field season when we have blueberries there. So this does show that there, there are some alternative hosts in the wooded areas that flies can live off and utilize and obviously survive. When we uh, compare the sex ratio of flies, as you can see, most of the populations is composed of females, which is again another uh, problem uh, parameter. The females are the ones that are going to sustain the population then lead to higher numbers during the next uh, generation and almost any time of the year except for September and I guess September we had one of the lowest numbers during the trapping year we followed this population. 
most, for the most part, females are much higher than the males. Now, we did not do this study. I just wanted to give you a heads up. We have growers, they want to do anything that they can to lower SWD population. And they know now that SWD can occur in the wooded areas. So one of the farmers, he went ahead and he burnt the wooded areas, everything in there, just to see if that would help with SWD population. And we have just monitored that, those sites. We had a location at the same farm where he burned. Actually, he did burn some to 2014, and this was done in 2015. And we followed this in 2015 burn afterwards to see how SWD numbers would compare. And the trend for both burnt and un unburnt sites was the same. As you can see, numbers were higher during the latter part of the year, winter, late fall, <coughs> and lower during the field season. But numbers overall were uh, lower in case where it was uh, burnt as compared to the unburnt site. So it did help some, but it did not eliminate the population. We know that there are some negative uh, consequences of burning because you can burn beneficials out there also or eliminate their habitat. So we are still thinking hard of whether we should pursue this further to do it more replicated scale or just to operate it as. Next. Now we know that flies are much higher in the wooded areas and there's a lot of uh, potential hosts that we occur. We, we see in our southeastern blueberries uh, and, and around. Here is a couple of them. As you can see here, but there's a lot of them. We did a study to see, characterize different potential hosts that we see in our situations and did choice and no choice assay to see whether SWD can utilize them as a viable host. In no choice assays, as you can see, there's a long list of potential hosts that were there and we evaluated them. A good number of those were the hosts where SWD successfully laid eggs, but very few made it all the way to a nurse. Only this uh, blackberry was the one which produced just as many uh, SWD as uh, blueberries themselves. So robust species, really good, they're kind of a favorite host, and other species they can sustain to some level, but not as good as blueberries. We then did the choice assays to see if they are given the choice between blueberry and one of the other uh, potential wild hosts. We ever take away, as, as you can see here, except for this uh, small gallberry, where none of the SWD actually over positive. In most cases, uh, there were some eggs laid in the alternative host. But in almost all cases, the majority of the eggs were laid in blueberries. So that puts burden back on blueberries. When we have blueberries in the field, they are going to prefer uh, blueberries over any other host that occur uh, around blueberries. So we, we do, do need to do something real to manage our blueberries against this uh, situation. That was all about wild hosts. We do have some cultivated potential hosts that could serve as a, as a yeah, host and add to the problem for blueberries. Since blueberries are the primary crop that farmers have, and these are in some cases just for fun, and in other cases they are actually grown commercially as well, but smaller scale as compared to blueberries. And we looked at these muscadine grapes. We, we know that muscadine grapes have thicker skin. We suspected that SWD might not be able to make it through uh, through the skin to overpause it and develop successfully. So we took samples from uh, unripe, ripe, and uh, overripe uh, muscadines. As you can see here, only in overripe muscadine grapes were SWD successful in laying eggs and completing their life cycle, which was obviously significantly lower number as compared to the normal ripe blueberries. However, when we visited out in the field, majority of the overripe muscadines had some kind of hack or they had some kind of uh, wound to them caused by either birds or some of the other bugs around in the system. That 
created a lot of problems. As you can see here, when those muscadines have some kind of wound, they're just as good as blueberries. And they, they, when you look at chronology of muscadine grapes as compared to blueberries, they provide additional two to three months of, of time when, uh, after blueberry harvest, whereas the beauty can survive, thrive, and be happy, and then have move on to the other wild hosts that might occur around those areas. So if growers are not utilizing these things as commercial, they should get rid of them. That's what we, we recommended, and we are uh, working with growers on that. If they are producing these muscadine grapes as a commercial crop, then they need to keep them clean and make sure that they manage the fruity in their teeth. And the second goes back to, uh, as I showed you the data, we have we see very few numbers, our lower numbers as compared to in during summer, as compared to the fall and winter time. And temperature is uh, one of the factors we think. It's in the literature that uh, above certain temperature, males become sterile and overall population kind of uh, stay lower. We wanted to explore that in the lab first. We did that, those studies at 24, 27, 33 degrees to see how temperature would affect their life cycle and biology parameters. As you can see here, OE position was significantly lower at higher temperatures. At 33 degrees, there was no OE position at all. Even at 30 degrees centigrade, we had uh, there are almost no adult emergence and very few adults were successfully eclored from those pupils. Lifespan was also reduced at higher temperatures. So this does explain why we are seeing lower numbers in the field in during the summer months. We then, then wanted to see how do these flies survive when we are seeing almost lethal temperatures in the field conditions during the blueberry harvest. We split the day into Six, four six hour windows, as you can see here, and put traps in the woods, border, and field to see how these flies move around. But we found that most of the flies were active during the dusk time at one side. At the other side, dawn and dusk. This explains why, how, how they tolerate those high temperatures that we experience in the field. Based on this information, we are recommending growers to make their applications for SWD during either dawn or dusk to make sure that in addition to getting residual activity, they can target that as fly populations as well. As you all know and uh, we know that chemicals is the only way currently to manage SWD effectively. Here is a list of chemicals that are based on studies done in several states that are effective against SWD, as you can see. For our conventional uh, management, we have lots of options, at least at this point. We have not seen any resistance issues so far, but with, with this much use, that's on the way. But problem, serious problem is with the organic situation where we have only one and trust that works. All of the other chemicals that we use in rotation, they're just to as part of resistance management programs, but they're not very effective. So, we tested some programs just to make sure growers rotate chemicals uh, in, to manage resistance and other issues. Residue is also another issue with small groups. So we did build these uh, four programs that we uh, tested at grower farms. We made applications one day and collected samples the same day, the third day, and one week after and followed these programs season long. And the results show, in our southeastern conditions, we don't have very long residual activity for most of the products. So these are numbers kind of summarized season long, especially when it rains. We don't see real good uh, residual activity. Even in the conventional system, in organic systems, it just dies <coughs> after a couple of days. In the third day, we get almost zero residue, residual activity out of, uh, out of the organic system. So organic production is in serious, uh, uh, serious situation here, and we need to come up with some kind of good management programs. Now, but as you saw, these numbers from residual activity being so poor, are we putting food at risk when we don't have residual activity after three to five days, 
and not spraying until one week after. And if some flies come in on fifth day and lays eggs, would the spraying on seventh day help some? We did some study to look at that, where we exposed uh, uh, blueberries in the field, in these cages, to flies, let them lay eggs. We sprayed before exposing fly, blueberries to flies to already spread a blueberry, and also uh, spread after flies have laid eggs in the field. Research show that when uh, we exposed, uh, we released flies after spraying, the majority of them died in most cases. Then we had already flies lay eggs and then spread. Very few individuals emerged out of those treatments. So it does mean that even if flies have already laid eggs, we still have some efficacy there to reduce overall population. So spraying weekly does help regardless. In this case, as we know, flies try to hang out, like to hang out in the shaded areas where it's cooler and high humid in the center of the canopy. In blueberries, maybe so, more in raspberries and other situations. So we did try to look at the coverage so we can show growers that coverage is extremely important. We, and growers try to, save, in order to save time, they try to use alternate row middles. We use two sprayers to compare alternate row middles versus every row middle. As you can see here, in alternate row middle using air blast, second row had significantly lower residual activity against SWD as compared to the Canon sprayer. As you can see, Canon has a row of nozzles on the side as well as a Canon. So second row gets really good coverage to the Canon. Whereas in air blast, second row did not get as well coverage. Here are the spray cards data. Overall, in, as uh, our mortality data showed, we did not have real good uh, coverage on the, in the second row for air blast. Whereas for air Canon, we did see some uh, coverage on, even in the second row. So if they're using the, the air cannon as a prayer, they can go with the alternate row middle, with air blast, no. Rainfall is a serious issue in our southeastern conditions. We did study to see, using simulated rainfall, to see if residues can hold up against some of the rainfall. The data showed, I'll show you just one slide, but trends were the same. Rainfall, any more than half an inch, significantly wash the residues down. Can we do something? We tried new pill to see if that can help some with some of the products, and it did help with the delegate and trust and marathon some at lowering rainfall up to one inch. Beyond one inch, no. It washed everything off. Just to summarize, stability is a big problem. It's everywhere. Wooded areas have lots of hosts in the southeast that SWD can survive, live off of, thrive. And even though we can get lethal temperatures, theoretically, the flies have places where they can go in the wooded areas, have cooler temperatures, high humidity, fast that time, come back in the evening, forage, or overposit, and go back. So spraying in the evenings or early mornings would be the best way to go. We do have good products for conventional, for organic, we are in a serious situation. We recently got a big OREI grant. I will show you a couple slides later. <laughs> yeah, and then coverage obviously is important because flies are already are looking for some places to hide where they have shade, temperature is lower, humidity is high. So if we can, if we don't get good coverage, we are in a serious problem. They are going to overpass it in fruit, which is in, in those shady areas. Rainfall significantly, can significantly reduce the residues, and if we use new film or some of the other adjuvants that might help, is a good idea. And we have some other projects uh, planned for this year to evaluate other uh, adjuvants as well. Hopefully they will, some of those will work for the other products as well. All right. With those broad spectrums going out, Secondary issues, pests are becoming major issues. Scales are the most common pest. Almost every grower I spoke with during this field season had a scale problem to some extent. Now, this is my technology part. It's just starting. 
We do try to. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we try to put information out as uh, whichever way possible. We have this Southern Small Fruit Consortium uh, guide that we use for the Southern region, Southeastern region at least. And then we have built a blog. Uh, at least, uh, currently, we are we have at least uh, 276, if I recall correctly. Joe has already signed up to. Uh, for, for the blog, as soon as we get some information or we think is useful information we put up there, it goes out to those growers instantly. So if you know somebody or you just are curious, sign up, your name and email, you will get updated. So what do we do next? And then we have recently built a, an app to help growers with the technology part so they can get everything. And I don't need to say anything is in there. Hopefully. It Hello, my name is Ash Seal and I'm blueberry entomologist at the University of Georgia. I wish you the best in 2016 and hope that 2016 holds very few insect pest problems for your blueberries. However, if you see any insect pests causing damage to your blueberries, we have got you covered. In addition to the existing resources such as UGA Blueberry Blog, we have recently developed a smartphone app to provide you the information you need to identify and manage insect pests of blueberries in the palm of your hand. The app is available for both iPhones and Android phones for free and is easy peasy lemon, oh no, blueberry squeezy to navigate. All you need to do is to go to the App Store for iPhones or Google Play Store for Android phones to search this app by the title my IPM dash SEF dash P and download it. Once the download is complete, tap on the app icon to get into the app. Here, tap on Blueberry to display the first main screen in the app. Here, you can select any pest you need information about from this list. For example, SWD. This will give you different options such as overview, active ingredients, trade names, etc. Select the overview and gallery option. Overview has brief information about the damage and control options for the selected pest. At the bottom of this screen, there is a 2 to 3 minute audio which contains basic information about biology and management of that pest. You can play the audio to listen to this information. Hello, my name is Ash Seal and I'm blueberry entomologist at the University of Georgia in the Department of Entomology. Today I would like to talk about spotted wing drosophila, widely known as SWD. You can then go to the gallery where we have put some pictures to help you identify the pest. You can tap on any picture you want to have a closer look at. Please note that there is a difference between iPhone and Android phone. In iPhone, these three options, summary, gallery, and more, are located at the bottom of the screen. Whereas in Android phone, these options are located on top of the screen. Overview, gallery, and more. From here, you can go to the more option, to get detailed information about signs and symptoms of the damage caused by that pest and also its life cycle. Here you can select chemical control or non-chemical control to get detailed information about these management options. You can then go back to the main screen where you can see the list of effective insecticides by the trade name. Here you can find information about application rate, pre-harvest interval, re-entry interval, and relative toxicity to consumers, workers, and the environment. 
you can also see the list of ingredients which is color coded based on the mode of action class they belong to. This is to help with resistance management. Please make sure to rotate insecticide classes from one application to the next. This will be tremendously helpful to slow the development of resistance in the target pest. This table also provides information about efficacy of these insecticides against the selected pest. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I hope that you will utilize this resource to make your IPM decisions. Please remember, we will continue to improve the contents and design of this app and I would really appreciate your feedback to improve this app to better serve your needs, which you can do by selecting the feedback option here. We got two grants, one through OREI to help develop organic management programs for SWD, and uh, we have a really good national level collaboration there. There is uh, 10 universities and USDA scientists involved in that project, and we are working hard to develop something for organic management, which is, as I mentioned, as you've seen, it's a big challenge. We are trying to address that challenge, well, hopefully, very soon. This is our advisory board members, again, diversity of growers. We have growers who have several thousands of organic <coughs> raspberries, blueberries, blackberries everywhere, and we have growers, 20 bushes in the backyard kind of growers. So when you are in the advisory board meeting, you get different kinds of feedback. It's, it was interesting. SCRI, Hannah is leading that project. We also got funding from NIFA to develop conventional SWD more sustainable rather than just relying on chemicals as we are doing right now. This is also a big national level collaboration with several institutions involved, as you can see right here. And if you have any questions, I'll be around.